right? So you're going to use the guidelines to create a very specific prescription for the individual described. And then, um, then you can use a Word document for the second part for the discussion of why you made those choices. Can you hear me, Kayla? It looks like your connection is dodgy. What's going on? I never usually have a problem, but if anything, I can do the recording later and see if maybe I... Okay. Um, and then I have office hours this afternoon. I know that you have practice, but it'll only take us a few minutes to answer your questions. Um, I think I have someone booked in at 3, actually I think it's Haley is booked in at 3.15. So if you want to jump into office hours around 3.45 or so, just for a couple of minutes, I'm sure Coach will be fine with that so that I can answer some questions for you. Um, I will see. I don't think I'll be pretty much gone from 3 until like 5 o'clock. <laughs> right. Will you have your phone with you though? always jump into office hours on your phone. Um, for about an hour and a half I won't. Okay. Well send me questions. Um, I'll send me something specific and I'll answer it for you. Okay. Alright. All right, so we have been talking um, about the fact that when the first set of guidelines came out in 1995, somewhere around 22% of adults in America um, were meeting those guidelines and being physically active. And then when we get to the um, update in 2018, so we're you know a long, long way, nearly 25 years on, now we still only see um, 23% or so, 24% of Americans achieving the goals. So in all that time, we're, we're just not making the progress with our physical activity habits. And when we move on now today and start to look at the diseases that can be positively impacted, you know, we're clearly not, as the book says, I use this quote because I think it just says it perfectly, we're not approaching the potential that physical activity has to reduce the threat of all these diseases that we're seeing. And that's really, really a shame. Um, this map, and I can't find where they have this map from. Um, I thought it was the CDC, but I can't find it at the CDC, but I have found another one that's really interesting. Um, and I can't find it at the DHHS either, so I'm not sure where, and they don't, frustratingly, put a good citation on their figure. Um, but you can see here that we have Alaska, um, probably because of the kinds of uh, jobs that are performed, I would think, in Alaska, 
Colorado is always top of any list that you look at, um, pretty much. And then, I don't know what this is. Whatever that is. Um, those are the three states that have 25% or more uh, physical activity participation. And then we go down from there, right? So that's not very happy making. There are a large number of states that are between 20 and 24%, 24.5%. So that's good to see. And then <laughs> good old Mississippi. I should know what that is and I don't. And maybe North Carolina are less than 15%. Um, physical activity participation. So I was trying to find it because I wanted to know how current those figures were, um, but I did find this one. So let me show you this one. This was at the CDC, which I thought was quite a fun, um, fun map. So this is uh, adults who usually walk or bike to work and it's the four year period between 2011 and 2015. They made some quite uh, gross assumptions on this because they, they only asked how did the individual get to work last week and then they um, made the decision to classify them as always going to work that way, um, which could have produced some quite large errors in the data. Um, but you can see here that um, Alaska apparently is a healthy place for walking, biking, and being physically active. But as I said, there's kind of jobs, I think, that are in Alaska that kind of lend themselves to some physical activity. Um, New Mexico, I love that New Mexico does better than Texas. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's an interesting one to look at. Um, I don't know how often they update that, 2011, 2015. I would have thought they would have some more census data by now, so maybe um, over the summer that might get updated, which would be interesting to see how it changes to the next block of four or five years. Okay, so the next part of the chapter is looking at um, diseases and comorbidities that respond well to regular physical activity. Um, and that's, I think, we were mentioning um, the other day, that's an important step. If we could get the, the medical profession really on board with prescribing physical activity, and, and it's heading that way, but that will also open up the job market for you guys, right? So, they have several categories, um, so they lump them under, category one is metabolic, category two is cardiovascular, category three is cancers, and then psychiatric affli afflictions. We're afflicted. <laughs> I, was, I thought that was an interesting word to use. So we'll look at the metabolic category first. Um, and the number one uh, issue that they discuss is obesity. Um, those of you that have taken 212, we have, we have to talk about obesity and overweight in motor behavior as well. Um, and 
It's just a burgeoning problem that sticks its little fingers into every pie, really. I mean, it's impacting so many different domains in a person's life that, you know, really there's very few departments probably on campus that don't have to um, introduce the idea of obesity somewhere in their curriculum, right? So this um, definition that they have in the chapter is from the Obesity Medical Association. So there's actually, I, I had no idea until I read that um, today that there was an Obesity Medical Association. Um, so that's a bit disturbing that it's so bad that it has to have its own association now. But you can see here um, the increase in numbers, right? 1990, 11% obesity. By 2016, there was 30% obesity. And remember that that first set of guidelines came in in 1995. So for most of this time, we've had a very good picture in the research and the clinical world of what needs to be done, and yet the picture is, as you can see, going in the wrong direction. So one of the interesting things that the uh, chapter talks about is that if you are physically fit and obese, that actually your morbidity rate is relatively similar to someone of normal weight who is fit, right? So the fitness element is providing this protective factor, right, from health risk. And, um, you know, that, that does introduce the question of, well, how do we, how do we get someone who is obese, physically fit enough that they see a decrease in other health risks like cardiovascular disease, you would have to use um, aqua, so do a lot of work in a pool. You would need to be using a cycle machine um, in a gym or a bicycle outside. Um, because you don't want to introduce uh, a walking, jogging um, type activity to someone with that much weight because of the amount of stress it would put on their joints, right? So if they're morbidly obese, right, then you might want to use some other ideas. Um, but it's a really interesting concept that, that we, can, we, we can help someone become more fit and it's going to impact these other health risks that they have because of this fat mass problem. You know, obesity is an extreme uh, amount of fat, body fat. And go back in the semester, we talked about we have subcutaneous fat and we have visceral fat, and that visceral fat is much more highly linked with the disease risk, right? So we know that increased physical activity can lead to weight loss, um, but it is most effective if we can combine it with a uh, change in diet and nutritional intake. So again, going back to our energy balance seesaw, right? And then the third point that they make is that being physically active will m help to maintain that weight loss so we don't have this yo-yo dieting that goes on for so many people. You know, they, they put a lot of work in on the diet, they lose the weight, they finish the diet, and then they put the weight back on. And then they go on another diet, and they lose weight, and then they finish the diet, and they put the weight back on it. If we can make that physical activity a habit, 
then it impacts this yo-yoing that goes on. Right? So obesity is no longer a comorbidity factor. It's now um, clinically recognized as a disease in its own right. So the American Medical Association uh, classified it as a disease in 2015, so not that long ago. Right? Um, but that's good because once it's classified as a disease, it means that if you go to the doctor, that doctor is legally now required to address your obesity. Right? They can't ignore it like they could before. Um, and, they, and that's where you guys are going to come in because the doctors, remember that, uh, those databases I was talking about on Monday, um, the doctors are going to need help because they're not trained in exercise prescription, right? They're trained in medical issues. So there's going to have to be this collaboration going on. Um, they talk a lot about BMI in this part of the chapter. Please remember that BMI is calculated using height and weight. So if you are a very healthy, physically active person, you may measure out on BMI as overweight or obese because of your muscle mass. Right? So remember that BMI is an indicator, not a definitive picture of overweight and obesity. Okay? The fitness idea, um, the literature is indicating, helps. So BMI over 30 is obese. Up to 40, that range, someone who falls in the 30 to 40 range can really benefit by improving their fitness. Right? Over that, if their BMI is over 40, and that apparently equates to being 100 plus pounds over your ideal weight for your sex and your height, then um, then fitness isn't going to impact your health risk. But that's a nice window there, right? 30 to 40. That's a good window of people that we can help. Okay. And this person is more than 100 pounds over his ideal weight. So he, he would not be looking to get fitter at that point. Um, but also I want you to think about the children. Okay. So look at this child. And this is not even as bad as many of the children I see walking around in Walmart in Portales, New Mexico. Right? So this child is in trouble. Right? And so we've got to not just work with the doctors for adults, but we've got to start impacting movement competency and nutrition in young children as well. And I wanted to show you a quick video. one in three children and adolescents is either obese or overweight. Obesity affects youth of all races, ethnicities, and income levels in all 50 states. Obesity has been labeled a childhood epidemic, and unfortunately, it leads to serious health problems. We are seeing more children and adolescents develop health problems that previously were seen primarily in adults, such as high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes and impaired glucose levels, high blood pressure, social problems and poor self-esteem, sleep disturbances and sleep apnea, and orthopedic problems. Children and adolescents 
who are obese have a 70 to 80% chance of becoming overweight or obese adults. Overweight and obese adults are at greater risk for heart disease, cancer, and stroke. These are leading causes of death among adults in the United States. A number of factors contribute to obesity, including lack of physical activity, sedentary lifestyle, unhealthy diet, and environmental factors. The good news is that these factors are controllable and reversible. fascinated that it existed and there is a if you go to the clinician resources um, there's a lot of information there um, but there's also a particular page for pediatric resources and when you click there it's not just geared towards clinicians there's also a lot of information here for families right and links to um, other resources that you can use to try to help children and help and help the parents learn what is good for the children. Okay, so there's it's not like we don't have a ton of resources available to us to help this problem.
Um, nowadays, physical activity is definitely part of the medical prescription for type 2 diabetics. So typically, um, depending how far along they are when they're diagnosed, um, the, the doctor will try changing in diet and adding physical activity. And then if that doesn't do the trick, because either that wasn't enough of uh, stimulation or the individual isn't able to maintain the program, then they'll have to also medicate. Um, but that's expensive. And you may remember that last, I think it was last year, gosh, it may even have been 2019, my timelines are all muddled in my head, but there was a big um, uh, big media outcry over the cost of insulin to diabetics because what was happening was that people on low incomes um, or on social support couldn't afford the insulin to treat their diabetes and so there was a major um, blow up in the media about it. So when we look at why physical activity and exercise help, um, what happens is that in, in the um, sarcoplasm of the muscle cells is a molecule called a GLUT4 transporter. And don't ask me what GLUT4 stands for. Um, well, I do know every now and then and then I forget. Um, but what happens is when you have repetitive rhythmical muscle contractions that we see with physical activity, um, then it moves that molecule from in the sarcoplasm up to the sarcolemma, to the surface of the muscle, and it acts like insulin. It provides a portal for glucose to leave the bloodstream and enter the muscle tissue and be used for energy. Um, the research suggests that um, combining aerobic work and resistance work is the most effective in controlling type 2 diabetes and we have a pre-diabetic, remember I think we did that in lab, that there's a pre-diabetic um, category now. So if we can catch more people at that pre-diabetic stage and get them into an appropriate exercise prescription, then we could even prevent them from developing full-blown type 2 diabetes, which would be very cool, right? Um, interestingly, the resistance training um, so a lot of people think that aerobic training is the way to go for diabetes, but the resistance training um, will increase some muscle mass, right, for most people. Um, and the more muscle mass I have, the more storage space I have for glucose to be stored as glycogen. Right? So the more muscle mass I have, the more blood glucose I can move out of the bloodstream and into the muscle tissue for storage. So the recommendation is to be active every day, um, or at least every other day, as we'll talk about later in the semester. That's because there's um, indications that the insulin sensitivity, the GLUT4 work, at the muscle membrane can last up to 48 hours if the duration and intensity of the workout was hard enough. So they would prefer that you were being active every day. It is not a training effect, right? There's not a chronic adaptation that solves the problem. It's an acute effect based upon the exercise bout. And so that means that we have to do the exercise bout every day to see the effect. Now another disease label that you might have seen is metabolic syndrome. 
You may have seen it called Syndrome X. Um, it certainly, when I left home, was still Syndrome X in the UK. I don't know if they've switched to the newer term of metabolic syndrome now. Metabolic syndrome is a, an umbrella term um, for other markers. So there are five different problems that can be grouped together to result in a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. You have to have three of the five concurrently for that diagnosis. Okay? So that's visceral obesity, so our fat around our tummies, our apple shape, right, that we talked about earlier in the semester. Hypertension, so high blood pressures, high blood triglycerides, low levels of HDLs, which are the good lipoproteins, and insulin resistance at the muscle membrane. Okay, so any three of that five that occur concurrently would result in a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. So on average, they think it's around 20% of the population, if you look worldwide, would be classified with that syndrome. But when we look in America, it's way higher than that. It's about 35% of adults in the US. So a much, much higher level of metabolic syndrome being seen in the US than, than across the globe. Um, it's more common in women, um, and the incidence does increase with age. But interestingly, um, you can be obese, but not be diagnosed with metabolic syndrome because you only have, maybe you're obese and you have high blood pressure. But you don't indicate the other problems. Or you can um, be relatively uh, normal weight or a little bit overweight and be diagnosed with metabolic syndrome, right? So again, it's three of the five. You don't have to have all five. The, the key is the visceral obesity, right? Because I can be obese, but I could be obese because I'm carrying a lot of subcutaneous fat, not visceral fat, right? Um, one way to identify visceral obesity issues is to look at waist circumference. We talked about that in lab um, back nearer to the beginning of the semester. All right, so um, equal to or greater than a 40 inch waist on a man, equal to or greater than a 35 inch waist on a woman. All right, and the other way is just to eyeball. Right? Is the waist wider than the hips? That's visceral obesity typically. Right? And remember that this visceral obesity is a much, much higher risk than subcutaneous obesity because of the way that the fat cells um, work. Right? They, they they don't react the same way as subcutaneous adipose cells. Visceral adipose cells are a beastie all of their own. Okay. So, these five markers, these five elements, can be improved through lifestyle changes in physical activity, lifestyle changes in nutrition, um, and some other behavioral factors as well. So physical activity can prevent the onset of visceral obesity. It can reduce abdominal visceral obesity if it's performed correctly. And remember that abdominal visceral obesity is linked to type 2 diabetes 
and cardiovascular disease. So the recommendation, if you're trying to target abdominal obesity, the recommendation is that you really need to increase the duration of the cardio session. So, um, you know, we've got that 30 to 60 minute window. You want to get these people fit enough to get closer to that 60 minute window. Or you can keep them at a lower duration, but you want to increase the intensity up to vigorous from moderate. Okay, now I am not certified by the ACSM or anyone like that. So I'll say that up front, but in my opinion, it would probably be safer to work on increasing the duration, not increase the intensity. Unless you're going to work in a pool. It's a little bit different in a pool, right? So um, that would be my personal preference. Right? Because high intensity work brings a much greater risk of orthopedic injury and it brings a much greater risk of heart attack or stroke. And you're already dealing with someone who is unhealthy. Right? So um, take that for what it's worth. Maybe it's worth nothing. Perhaps it's worth nothing. I've got here. Oh, oh, I'm not going to get through everything. Okay, um, another block they have is diseases that are cardiovascular in nature. So the first one is stroke. And um, if you remember back, we, we looked at stroke and coronary artery disease. So stroke is a blockage in the vasculation in the brain, right? So we have not enough glucose and not enough oxygen reaching the brain. Um, if you can, if you're well enough to include a physical activity program, so if the doctors say, yeah, go for it, then what they've shown is that being physically active after a stroke can reduce the number and or the severity of a follow-up stroke. So quite often people who have one stroke end up having several strokes. Um, and the other thing is that it will help with what they call post-episode recovery um, variables. So things like being able to walk more quickly, for example. Um, and the recommendation is that aerobic work there would be uh, the primary physical activity choice for post-episode recovery. Hypertension, go back and look at our chart that we did, right? Systolic, so the contraction phase uh, of 140 or higher, and a diastolic relaxation phase of 90 or higher. And it can be either one or both. So having high blood pressure puts you at much higher risk of strokes and heart attacks um, and death. Aerobic tends to um, be more effective for hypertensive individuals um, of uh, that lower category of hypertension. But the recommendation is still to combine, to supplement, really, the aerobic work with some resistance work. So that resistance work will help a little bit with the hypertension later, right? If the person can do resistance work, right? So if the person has a systolic blood pressure that's higher than 180 or a diastolic blood pressure that's higher than 105, they probably are not even going to get signed off to, to do any exercise or to do a physical activity program, period. Because exercise at, at that higher blood pressure is too dangerous. You've got to get it down first. 
and they'll have to use medication for that. And then if they can get the blood pressure down, then the person can start a physical activity program. We can see lower resting blood pressures for up to 10 hours post-session, depending upon how much work was done in the session. Right? So there's um, a decrease in vasoconstriction with regular physical activity. So again, it's not just the one-off bout. It's not the going for a hike with the grandchildren at the weekend. It has to be a daily thing. It's got to be part of life. And that's where the problem occurs. Right? That's why we have less than 25% of adults in America meeting the guidelines. Because they don't do enough movement every day. Once a week isn't going to cut it. So we blunt the sympathetic response with exercise and that brings blood pressure down for a period of time. Okay. Then coronary artery disease is, if you remember, the same as stroke but going on with the heart. So now we've got a decreased blood flow to a portion of the heart muscle that causes ischemia and death of the muscle cells. Okay. And physical activity can prevent coronary artery disease because it stops fatty plaque buildups within the coronary arteries. Um, it can help to manage recovery from a heart attack. Um, and it can improve your chance of survival if you have a heart attack. Right? So if you've been physically active for a long period of time and you unfortunately have a heart attack, you're much more likely to survive that because your heart is strong and your other systems are working optimally. Okay, physical activity can help to reduce the incidence of certain cancers. So we've had metabolic grouping, we've had a cardiovascular grouping, we've got a cancer grouping. So breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, many, there are quite a few cancers that seem to respond well to exercise. So you may not develop the cancer if you have a regular exercise program and um, your chances of survival and the, uh, a good quality of life are much better if you include physical activity in your daily life post-cancer. So um, that's really important um, people who are undergoing treatment for cancers often report that they're um, less tired, um, that they haven't lost as much strength as they expected to, um, and that their, that their quality of life while in treatment is better than they expected it to be. Um, so some of those changes are to do with the endocrine system, which we don't have time to cover in detail, but there is a chapter on it if you're interested in your book. Um, the anti-inflammatory effect of exercise and um, managing body fat levels because body fat levels are associated with certain cancers. We need much more work on the impact of exercise with cancer, in my view. Um, and then our last group is psychiatric afflictions. What a way, that sounds so old-fashioned to me, psychiatric afflictions gives me pictures of 
the like 1940s and 1950s madhouses where people were locked up and bits of their brains chopped off and <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little um, nuts. Well, no, I'm not so, so that's okay. So I haven't had a chance to read this part of the chapter as much as I wanted to. I only had time to glance through it this morning um, while I was trying to get this ready. Um, so for depression, um, it's often uh, used um, sometimes on its own, but often in collaboration with medication um, to try to help the person overcome periods of just deep blackness. Right? I don't know how else to describe it really. Um, and so there's uh, quite a quite a good link. There's lots of literature that says people with depression feel better after they have done some work. Um, one thing I had never seen before, and I'm going to try and find this article and read it over the summer, is that the textbook um, states that resistance training is more effective at treating and combating depression than aerobic training, which that I had never heard. So um, I want to follow up on that idea. Uh oh, so the other, so there's anxiety and stress. You guys will have to look at anxiety and stress because it's time to finish. And I think that's it. Okay, so if I am correct, we will have a review on Friday and exam number. Four, four? Are we up to number four already? Will be on Monday. All right. I did send out a revised schedule. I emailed that to everybody earlier this week, maybe even over the weekend, can't remember. No memory. Um, but I did email everybody the new schedule in Blackboard. So you've got that. I'm pretty sure review is Friday, exam is Monday. Okay. Any questions quickly? I go on real fast. Yeah. So for the fit chart, would it be acceptable if could I send it into you like via email so you could look it over before I turn it in officially? You certainly are welcome to do that and I will do my best to take a look at it and give you some feedback. Um, I am crazy busy for the rest of this week, but I will try. Okay, would you rather me send it via uh, portal or blackboard? Blackboard, please. Blackboard, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Okay. All right, well, have a super rest of your